Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Lieutenant Commander Sarah Nugrishel, and I am the outgoing Chief of Plans, Policy, and Partnerships at U.S. Cyber Command Office of the Staff Judge Advocate. As you heard in Colonel Hayden's welcome remarks, we can't do anything without our partners, and that's especially true when it comes to our partnership with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. So I'm thrilled to introduce Mr. Brandon Wells, the Executive Director of CISA. As Executive Director, Mr. Wells serves as the Senior Career Executive, helping oversee execution of CISA operations. He is responsible for leading long-term strategy development, managing CISA-wide policy initiatives, and ensuring effective operational collaboration across the agency. Some highlights from his illustrious biography include, in February 2022, he was appointed as the lead for the federal government's domestic preparedness and response related to the Russian-Ukraine crisis. And prior to that, from November 2020 through July 2021, Mr. Wales was the acting director of CISA. In that capacity, he led CISA's efforts to defend civilian networks, manage systemic risk to national critical functions, and work across both the public and private sectors to raise the security baseline of the nation's response to the SolarWinds Orion supply chain attacks, Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, and the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attacks, amongst many others, while completing this stand-up and reorganization of the agency following the passage of the CISA Act of 2018, which established CISA as an independent agency. Joining Mr. Wales is our very own Colonel Nate Kearns. Colonel Kearns currently serves as the Air National Guard Assistant to U.S. Cybercom's Office of the Staff Judge Advocate, as well as the Senior Lawyer and Advocate for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. As if that wasn't enough, in his civilian capacity, Colonel Kearns is the Director of Operations at the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies, where he has planned, managed, and executed over 150 international missions in 100, over 100 countries. And when Colonel Kearns is not globetrotting, he's also an adjunct professor of law at Boston College. Colonel Kearns, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Director. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just kind of run through some topical areas and, and questions. And uh, at some point, if we have extra time, we'll hear from some folks from the audience. Sure. So the first thing I'd like to ask you about is some of the current cyber and operational challenges faced by CISA, and if you wouldn't mind addressing both domestically and internationally, sir. Sure. So uh, first, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, I think, as, as was noted, uh, this mission is one that's built on partnership, uh, and the work that we do with uh, Cyber Command, the National Security Agency, DOD more broadly, is uh, essential to the work that we do both domestically and internationally. In terms of some of the challenges uh, that we are facing, um, I, you know, I would say it's at the intersection of a couple of, of trends. The first is, uh, you know, the, over the last decade, the increasing digitization of, of everything, meaning that uh, IT systems, things that, were, that are today enabled by IT systems that weren't a decade ago, um, create uh, increasing risk. Uh, secondly, the increasing complexity of the technology in general has meant that a large portions of our critical infrastructure are operating using technology that they really have no business using um, uh, because they don't have the innate capability to actually secure it. Um, and, and third is the level of sophistication that our adversaries pose now to this technology kind of has all come together in a perfect storm. Um, and so uh, these are challenges that face us not only here uh, domestically, they, they um, are the same ones our international partners are grappling with. I was talking this morning um, uh, with uh, colleagues from across Europe uh, at an event that the Lithuanian government uh, Ministry of Defense was holding, and it was the same exact topics, um, how to grapple with the challenges of emerging technology uh, and cybersecurity in the face of growing threats. I'll remind everyone that the director was uh, on the phone with Lithuania at probably 0330, so an extra <laughs> thanks for, for, for being here for us. Uh, so, so I was wondering if we could also get your thoughts. You, you mentioned it briefly on sort of the current threat landscape. You, you know, the, I would say if you wouldn't mind addressing some of the radical um, transparency, the international collaboration, communication, and, and you sort of touched on it, sort of the 
um, what we didn't have in the past, we now have a lot more uh, folks, agencies, governments with access to previously uh, things that we hadn't had before. Yeah, so you know, when I look at the, the threat space, and you know, I think many of you uh, know this uh, very well, trying to deal and grapple with uh, going after these threat actors, um, when I look at the threat space, I see kind of two, two unique challenges when it comes to the specific threat actors that we're facing. Um, on the one hand, the nation states that we are dealing with today um, uh, have grown a lot better at what they do. They're able to hide more effectively. They're able to obfuscate their activity. It is harder to keep track of the specific uh, threat actors. We have good on insight, thanks to our intelligence community partners, about strategic uh, intentions, but a lot less insight in terms of what they are doing tactically day to day. Um, and that is because they've grown better, their tradecraft has improved, they're operating, um, uh, you know, they're, they're no longer developing custom malware as often, they're now living off the land. Um, and so it makes it a lot harder for us to discern exactly what they are doing, where they're doing it, and how they're doing it. And they're able to burrow in and hide in networks in ways that they, we didn't think they were able to do in the past. And on the other hand, the uh, the kind of democratization of um, uh, capabilities for criminal organizations have kind of lowered the barrier entry for criminals to get involved in, in more sophisticated cyber type attacks because they'll uh, utilize ransomware as a service or other tools that are developed by more capable criminal actors and who sell or lease those um, uh, to lower skilled actors. And so it has meant that you know, the scourge of ransomware ramped up over the last two or three years as criminal organizations have specialized. Um, and all of that is now hit against this, what is a largely an insecure technology base. Um, as I mentioned before, we have dramatically increased the digitization of everything. However, our technology infrastructure today is not designed with security in mind up front. What gets technology to the front of the market today is based on cost, speed, and innovation. And it's not around security. And that has meant that every day thousands of new vulnerabilities are discovered in technology. And it is not sustainable that any, actor, any, any company, any government is going to be able to keep pace with the scale of vulnerabilities that they're the technology base that they're dealing with. Um, so we have been pushing, um, thanks to our director, uh, Jen Easterly, a new focus on kind of secure by design and secure by default. That technology needs to be developed upfront that is more secure and that it is, it is by design and by default deployed in the most secure way possible. And it needs to be easy enough that small and medium sized businesses or small and, and uh, government agencies and, and local governments around the country, municipal hospitals and water systems, that they have the ability to use this technology um, uh, in a secure way. And that's just not the case um, right now. And we know that because as soon as new vulnerabilities are, are identified, we can see the malicious actors exploiting those vulnerabilities at scale. And we're never going to patch our way out of it. Um, so it is great that we're identifying those and companies are deploying patches. Uh, but the scale of those vulnerabilities mean that we're always um, uh, behind the eight ball. We're always chasing the adversary. Uh, and so the only way to get ahead of that is um, this focus of kind of getting ahead of it. We want companies to be de designing and deploying technology that is as safe and secure as possible up front. So I guess along those same lines, you're mentioning some of the challenges that we're seeing out there. Could you... Uh, maybe address some of the strides and some of the, the successes we're seeing or partnerships on the way ahead, both domestically and internationally as well. Sure, and I think this is a place where, um, as I said at the beginning, you know, this entire mission space is built around the, the, the notion of partnerships, and CISA as an agency was designed uh, to be a partnership agency. We're not a law enforcement entity, we're not really a regulator, we're not an intelligence community. Our real um, uh, the reason why we were created was is to build and sustain partnerships between government and industry. We do that in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, and at its center is kind of establishing this strong trust that when we provide this useful information uh, around cyber threats or incidents, um, uh, tactics and tradecraft, uh, that it will generate uh, useful outcomes. Um, so we have 
uh, seen this in a number of cases, whether it's um, our response to the vulnerability in the Log4j software library at the end of 2021, uh, uh, where we served as kind of an authoritative source for um, what, uh, what products were vulnerable, which ones were being patched and provided that information in a transparent way to the community. Um, similarly, we stood up our joint cyber defense collaborative um, in 2021. This was um, something that had come out of the Cyberspace Layering Commission, was um, authorized by Congress uh, at the beginning of 2021 uh, to create this joint cyber planning office we call the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative today. Um, where we bring in industry, uh, starting with the largest technology, cloud, ISPs, cybersecurity firms, brought in uh, the U.S. government entities that focus on cyber from across um, the interagency. Uh, so folks here at Cyber Command, NSA, FBI, DOD, DOJ, um, to all work together with the idea we want to reduce uh, any barriers and we want to reduce the kind of uh, previous work that we done with the private sector that tend to be one-on-one. -on -one. We share information with one company, they share some with us. We do that 50 times, and by then we piece together a, a story. Well, we decided to go to a multi-to-multi -multi, uh, sharing environment where um, in the early days of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, when one of the companies in the JCDC was seeing uh, the initial malware being used by uh, Russian government actors, they were sharing it with all of the members of the J Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative uh, in real time. Uh, reducing the amount of time it takes to get information out from kind of days to hours. Um, we think that those are, are real successes. It is also enabling us to kind of build trust with that community, so they're sharing new insights with us. So one of the new things that we've just announced that was based upon um, uh, individuals from across cybersecurity firms coming to us to say, and technology companies, we, they started seeing things happening uh, because they had access inside of some of the adversary infrastructure. So they were seeing ransomware operators um, connected to U.S. critical infrastructure, but they didn't have relationships to go touch those critical infrastructure entities. Um, so they came to us and said, hey, we believe that these entities are being targeted by these ransomware crews. They have access in there, but we don't think that they've encrypted their networks yet. Um, can you go let them know? So just in the last um, four months, we've notified over 120 U.S. and international companies that um, they had ransomware operators on their network prior to an encryption happening. Um, and we've had, at this point, numerous examples where the companies have come back to us and said, thank God you told us because actually we just saw them try to activate the, um, uh, the malware they had put in our network. Um, and it was only because they had early warning um, that they were able to stop it. And this is, there's been about a dozen schools, hospitals um, that have benefited from this, as well as 20 international partners uh, around the world. So we think this is a model where, you know, SIS is not doing the heavy lifting here. We're, we are, we've built a, a relationship, we've established trust, and now people are coming to us with information that we think is really game changing in terms of getting ahead of, um, of some of these challenges. And so, I think it demonstrates the, the power of partnership uh, to advance the cybersecurity mission um, and the importance that building these kind of trust-based models uh, with both industry and government, uh, why it's so essential. Well, those are great examples. Thank you for, for sharing those. I know one of the things that uh, folks in the room that the Cyber Command is interested in, and, and it just happened to coincide with this, this conference, is the new national cyber strategy. And so there's a specific area I wanted to ask you about because critical infrastructure, as you know, is a key element. Um, I wanted to ask about that relationship of private enterprise and if you could address the responsibility to protect and sort of elaborate on that for us. Sure. So, you know, CISA, um, you know, I've, I've been around with uh, the agency from before when it was, before it was known as CISA, when it had much more complicated and less discernible names. Um, and... Uh, we were always around, you know, our mission has always been around critical infrastructure. Um, we started, uh, our agency was formed, uh, its predecessors in the wake of 9-11 of attack to focus on the physical security of critical infrastructure. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, it kind of expanded from the original CT mission to focus on more all hazards resilience uh, related to critical infrastructure. But um, uh, till, you know, still today, um, when we talk about um, uh, the homeland, we talk about cybersecurity, we're still predominantly talking about what we need to do to protect and secure and make more resilient our, our critical infrastructure. Um, the, the new national cyber 
security strategy um, recognizes as one of the key pillars the protection of U.S. critical infrastructure because it's so essential to, to our way of life, um, our economic security, our national security, the work we're doing with DOD focusing on defense critical infrastructure is an example. Um, and the national cyber strategy recognizes that we need to use a variety of tools to get after this problem. Um, we need to use regulatory authority where it makes sense, where we have the authority, where, where we think we need to, to get it. I think you've seen some examples of that. Uh, for example, TSA uh, in the aftermath of the um, cloning a pipeline incident uh, decided to use authority that they had but had not previously deployed uh, to regulate, have minimum baseline cybersecurity standards uh, for pipelines, for rail, for aviation. Um, uh, EPA has put new responsibility on state authorities that conduct sanitary surveys of water utilities um, to put in place. They need to do cyber security reviews when they conduct those, those surveys. Um, but regulation is one part, um, largely done by uh, key regulators across the U.S. government, some independent, some part of uh, underneath the executive branch. Um, but CIS's role, as I you know, referred to earlier, is more um, kind of helping to coordinate the, the voluntary efforts across the government. So um, we build these partnerships, we've established these mechanisms, we were given these unique authorities to create information sharing mechanisms that are in some cases protected from regulatory law enforcement use to encourage industry to come to us, share information on critical vulnerabilities um, so that we can uh, use those to make the entire ecosystem more secure. Uh, it's the reason why we brought critical infrastructure into our joint cyber defense collaborative because they have unique insights uh, into this and they can also take action at scale that the U.S. government can't take alone. So getting uh, 100,000 water utilities in the United States to do something is hard. Um, getting three cybersecurity companies to, to take action that is used on hundreds of thousands of uh, companies across the world uh, is comparatively much easier. So um, I think we look at this, um, you know, from a variety of perspectives um, and try to figure out how we harness uh, our kind of strong capabilities uh, with that of our other agencies. How do we lend our expertise to regulators uh, while still maintaining our ability to have real trusted relationships uh, with, with industry. So I think that there are um, uh, you know, and you can certainly ask uh, Steve Kelly when uh, he comes and gives his talk since the White House has been uh, at the forefront of thinking through how to um, utilize all of the different uh, expertise and capabilities across the U.S. government to achieve this mission. Um, it's complicated. Uh, there's not going to be one size fits all to these challenges we face because of the unique authority structure, because of the unique challenges, uh, what will work in a um, highly centralized uh, small sector is not going to work in a highly diffused uh, sector made up mostly of, of um, small and, and medium-sized businesses or municipal authorities. Uh, and so it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of thoughtfulness about how do you employ um, these strategies. The National Cyber Director is now working on an implementation plan for how do you take some of these ideas, identify what's working now really well, and where are the gaps that we need to continue to work to, to build a stronger ecosystem. So you just talked quite a bit about private industry, and I'd like to kind of head down that road for a second. Um, what role or where do you see private industry, say, the next five to ten years, and looking at the companies that you know, everyone in this room knows, the, the, the Googles, the Apples, the Microsoft, what role are they playing, and, and how do they partner with us, and, and what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so you know those those large companies have been kind of key partners to us because they have unique visibility. They have the ability to scale solutions very quickly. Um, that being said, kind of going back to the national cyber strategy, one of the key policy shifts that identified the national cyber strategy is putting the burden of cybersecurity on those best able to handle it. Today, almost the entire burden of cybersecurity is on the end user, and whether you are a small business of three people or you are a Fortune 50 company, you both have the same burden of cybersecurity even though the re requisite capacity is far different in those two entities. Um, we don't think that that's sustainable and the national cyber strategy reflects that. So I think we believe that technology companies, because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, have a unique responsibility here um, uh, to take on a higher burden of, of providing uh, products that are more secure, make it easier for those small and medium-sized companies to be able to utilize their technology. And even for large companies today, still dealing with a relatively insecure technology ecosystem, 
Um, oftentimes, you'll talk to a, you know a, you know a small you know one of the large companies in the country uh, that's in critical infrastructure, and they'll tell you that they're using 150 or 200 different cybersecurity tools to protect their network. And now they have to figure out how to integrate 200 tools to provide their analysts with actual you know actionable insight about how to protect their networks. And then they have to hire consultants to work to help them improve their integration of those 200 tools. Um, and it's all because we have an insecure technology base. So, you know, I think we think it starts from there. It, secondly, it moves to thinking through how does corporate America uh, look at cybersecurity um, for CEOs, for boards of directors? Uh, is this just a problem that they can assign to the CIO and think it goes away? Or is this something that they have to take core responsibility for? Because ultimately, this is not just an IT problem, but this is kind of core business risk. Um, and the companies that have had significant breaches, um, significant incidents, they know that it's core business risk. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it takes getting to that point um, before uh, a company will be kind of galvanized into action. And so um, we think that there's a, and we've kind of been pitching this concept of um, uh, cyber um, uh, cybersecurity, corporate cybersecurity, corporate cyber responsibility. Sorry, that's the uh, 4 a.m. showtime with Lithuania uh, talking. Um, corporate cyber responsibility, the idea that you as corporate leadership have a kind of unique responsibility here to make sure that you are addressing the systemic risks to your operations. And those could be first order, how well you're doing protecting your networks, but also when I talk to business leaders across the country, um, the thing that most often comes up is third party risk. Um, uh, they think that they've got their network under control, rightly or wrongly, uh, but they're concerned about the suppliers, the vendors inside of their supply chain uh, that they think exposes them to a risk that they're not able to sufficiently manage. Um, and so they're, you know, that is a place where I think um, it is, is the unique responsibility here to work between government and industry to figure out how to expand that protective umbrella. What can those companies do to help the small companies in their supply chain, what, we can, what can we do to help bolster uh, them? So we have some initiatives that we are, uh, we have launched this year uh, focused on what we call um, cyber, uh, um, uh, target rich cyber poor. Uh, the idea being these are companies and segments of the economy that are often targeted by adversaries, uh, but they don't have the capacity. So hospitals, K through 12 schools, um, uh, water facilities. And so we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how do we provide them more services. Congress gave us the ability to expand some of the shared service offerings that we have pr previously provided just to our federal uh, civilian partners out to some of our critical infrastructure entities. Um, so we're looking at doing that starting this year using some of this new authority from Congress. Um, but we think it is super important uh, that both the government and large companies together take that responsibility to figure out how we broaden this because ultimately every company in this country relies upon a network of small companies um, uh, that are the weak underbelly of, of our cyber ecosystem. Sir, along that same vein with these public-private partnerships, uh, how would you say that extends to the challenges of, with our international partners? Yeah, so I'd say all the challenges we have here, they're just magnified overseas because they often have less capability, less capacity. When I think about um, the amount of, of of um, expertise and capability that resides in the federal government between uh, CISA, the FBI, NSA, Cyber Command, DOJ, um, DNI, um, and the really vibrant cybersecurity ecosystem in the private sector here. Um, you know, when we start working with international partners, some of those uh, folks obviously have a lot of capability. We work extremely closely with a number of our uh, Five Eyes partners, have done a lot of joint production with them on guidance. Uh, but when you start talking about country in America, Southeast Asia, there's a lot of capacity that's needed um, uh, to be built. And these are countries that uh, make up critical supply chains uh, for, for the United States that we rely upon for US companies. Um, and so there is a real appetite out there um, across the world, whether it's uh, countries in Europe um, that I was on the call with today or, or countries um, in the kind of global south that um, want to get better at this because they're seeing challenges. When you've had countries like Costa Rica that have been ravaged by a ransomware incident affecting their government for, uh, that lasted for, for, for weeks, um, they recognize that, that they need to get better, but they don't necessarily have the capacity. And so I think we are looking at what we can do to help build that. 
Um, obviously, our focus is still here at home, but there is a lot that we learn um, in terms of early warning from working with their international counterparts. We have relationships with over 200 uh, certs, the computer emergency response teams around the world uh, that we share information with regularly. Um, uh, but there's a lot that we're trying to figure out how we give back. We've been doing a lot of capacity building with Ukraine. Uh, obviously, right now, we have a, we've got some work that we've done through Singapore to ASEAN countries uh, to expand capacity. Um, but there is just a, a lot more work to do out there um, because there is a real hunger um, and just not enough capacity. So you've mentioned a little bit uh, about you know, DOD's role and Cybercom's role. Just to, to take it to you know, the folks in this room, to you know, the SJs here, a bunch of the staff are here, you know, where is CISA, where is Cyber Command, where are we going together, where do you see the next few years as that relationship? Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, we think that the relationship between the offensive and defensive work is, is really essential. Um, and um, I think our goal over the next few years is to make that um, uh, the information flows um, and the tipping and queuing back and, back and forth um, even faster, more ingrained, um, uh, because when it works, it's worked super well. And so there's been real world examples. And since we're um, going out to the world, I'll be um, uh, circumspect here, but there's been real world examples where the activities that you're, you're doing overseas has given you insight into um, uh, actual incidents here in the homeland. You've handed it over to us. Uh, CISA and the FBI go out and talk to the victim. Maybe we do some incident response. Now we're identifying additional, um, uh, whether it's ad additional activity that the adversary was doing, um, uh, additional infrastructure that they were utilizing. We're passing that back to you guys that you're using to expand the scope of, of, of your mission to identify additional targets to, to go after and back and forth. And I think that type of uh, symbiotic relationship is, is really critical. And I think it has worked um, extremely well when it's worked. And I think we now need to figure out how, what, you know, are there gaps, what we need to do to ingrain that type of, of relationship um, so that it, it, is, it is smooth. Frankly, you know, it is new. Um, uh, Cybercom is a relatively new entity, uh, certainly at full operating capability. CISA um, in its kind of current incarnation is relatively new, and I think we need to make sure that we build some muscle memory uh, where this is just happening um, as a matter of course. Um, the other area um, that I would touch upon here um, is, is obviously the relationship between um, Cyber Command uh, with the various you know, Cyber National Guard uh, units around the country, in part because we've got a very close relationship with our state and local governments. We do a lot of work to provide uh, support to, um, uh, to, those, to those state and local governments, and a lot of state governments uh, will utilize their Cyber National Guard units to help uh, buttress and support uh, state level and, and uh, incident response activities uh, uh, within their jurisdictions. Um, and so I think it is more important than ever that we've got good relationships. So CISA has um, a growing uh, footprint across, across the country. We have about 600 field-based personnel, um, mostly made up of uh, various types of security advisors, both physical security, um, some of them focused on emergency communications, um, and about 100 cybersecurity advisors uh, spread out across the country who are there um, to do assessments and, and build relationships with our critical infrastructure and state and local partners. Um, and many of those folks do have good relationships with their, um, uh, with their tags and, and other National Guard-related uh, leadership um, at, at the state level, but kind of thinking through what is the future of that relationship? What does it look like for information flow? What does it look like when you're actually conducting um, operations at the state level? Um, how do we provide um, mutual support in those, in those situations? Um, so I do think that there's a lot of uh, growth. One of the things that we have uh, rolled out over the last year is a new grant program for state and local governments. Um, uh, Congress gave us as part of the uh, Infrastructure Investment Act a uh, billion dollars over four years to give out, again, cybersecurity grants focused um, for state and local governments. Um, and uh, they're using that in a variety of ways. The first tranches of money actually just started going out the door a few weeks ago because we approved the first 12 uh, plans uh, that were submitted by states that had to submit pursuant to the, to the law. Um, and so there is more capacity that's going out and being built at the state and local level. And we know um, that National Guard uh, units are kind of a key part of that uh, ecosystem at the state and local level. So the more we can do to 
understand what that looks like um, so that we can have where we need to have consistency, where we need to have uh, you know, unique state tailored efforts, we can do that. No, uh, uh, Brandon, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it, um, especially the, the plug at the end. I, I, I will say um, through the Cyber Nine line, through the establishment of state and local partnerships, the uh, ability that I, I hear across the, the 54 states and uh, commonwealths and territories is uh, they have never come across uh, an, an agency that they've reached out to that hasn't had a constant support or an ability to proactively help them or, or reach out to them. And it's just been uh, fantastic. So thank you for that, sir. Uh, what I'd like to do now, I think we still have a couple of minutes, is uh, open it up to uh, some folks in the audience. I know that there's uh, some folks that would really want to take advantage of this opportunity. If anyone has any questions, we ask that you just turn your microphone on so that those virtually can hear as well. Morning, sir. Um, Frank Shaw from Army Cyber. Uh, Ms. Wales, you had mentioned um, larger companies taking on a greater responsibility for cybersecurity um, when you have the you know, three-person small business who doesn't have the capacity for that. Since those larger companies are ultimately accountable to their shareholders, what is the incentive for them to do that outside of their organic supply chains? Like, how has that conversation been to incentivize them to do that? Yeah, no, it's, it, is, it is a good question. Um, and you know, I think it'll likely depend upon kind of the criticality of those small um, and medium-sized businesses in their supply chain. The ones that are obviously more critical, the ones that have less substitutability, um, you may feel maybe much more willingness when there are kind of more single points of failure um, uh, for their operations. I also think that it is a question of uh, what exactly you're doing, how complicated is it? Um, you know, there are some things that could be relatively easy. You know, you have uh, certain services you might pay for from a cybersecurity vendor to provide protective DNS for your, for your network, um, relatively inexpensive to add some uh, protections for another party if they're willing to, to, to do that. Um, whereas more intrusive capability is probably not true. But you also think about kind of what your due diligence is, what your um, ability to provide some uh, support and uh, mentorship as they, for what they need. Ultimately, I think it's going to be, you know, they have to represent their shareholders, but ultimately if they think their business um, is at risk, to think that their operations could be compromised because of weak cybersecurity at one of those vendors, um, then you know, I think it, arguably it is in their shareholders' interest uh, to provide that, just like it is in their shareholders' interest to invest in their own um, organic cybersecurity. Um, and, and frankly, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, this is third-party risk is the number one issue that I have heard consistently across every critical infrastructure sector. And so if every critical infrastructure sector says, I am worried about third-party risk, they can't then say, well, but I can't really fix it because my shareholders. You know, ultimately, if it's one of your top cybersecurity risks, then you need to be willing um, to invest. And if that's not just in your organic capability, if that's in helping third parties that are critical to your business, you know, that's where it is. Good day, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Mike McCarthy, Canadian Armed Forces, Office of the Judge Advocate General. Uh, very fascinated by the use of National Guard in assisting with local and state, I guess, cybersecurity. And I'm just wondering how that came to be and whether there's been any pushback from private industry who also would provide those services normally. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really think that this is something where um, uh, I think it probably most likely started in some, and maybe there's some here who can actually answer that question better than I, but um, my sense is that it started with a lot of the ransomware incidents that started affecting municipalities around the country. And when a uh, governor looked at this problem and said, what assets do I have at my disposal that can try to deal with it immediately? Um, Cyber National Guard units uh, under state authority were able to be activated um, uh, to help. Um, and I think that is makes good sense. My, you know, at the end of the day, I don't believe that those National Guard units are really displacing at large scale um, uh, cybersecurity uh, vendors throughout the country. In many cases, um, if you're responding to a large scale incident like a ransomware incident, you're most likely 
you know, you could have the National Guard helping out for a period of time, but you're still going to bring in uh, private sector vendors to, 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 to finish the job, to, to rebuild parts of your network, um, to, you know, focus on long-term security. I think in many cases, National Guard has been sent in there first, kind of stabilize the situation, begin to get things back up and running, and then this transitions more long-term to um, a private sector vendor. But I think it is um, a recognition uh, that there is a lot of need out there um, and that the National Guard was a um, ready source of real expertise in a, in a place and a time uh, where governors did not have a lot at their disposal. But it's not consistent because we've engaged with states that have had incidents and they've immediately brought in one of the large cybersecurity vendors um, and other states will bring in the National Guard and later bring in uh, you know, a contractor to come help and, and, and finish the job. So we've seen a variety of different types. There's no one size fits all in terms of how states or municipalities will address this, address this problem. Um, but I, I think it is one where um, we are likely to see consistent use of the National Guard um, uh, across the country because it is a real source of expertise um, that is under the, under the authority of the governor um, and can be readily deployed uh, when they have a significant incident. I'll, I'll just add one thing as the Air National Guard assistant here at the U.S. Cyber Command is, um, you know, there's a direct liaison relationship to CISA uh, where our folks across the 54 states, commonwealths, and territories can directly reach out through the Cyber Nine line directly to members of CISA. The members of that team have been incredibly proactive in the sense of if, if you think there may be an issue or you think there may be a malware, for instance, you know, reach out proactively and they will provide, you know, guidance, information, et cetera. Also, under Colonel Hayden, uh, U.S. Cyber Command has a specific division that the Guard can also reach out to. Uh, as, as, as Brandon put, there are, uh, you can imagine like different companies, some that are more robust, very well developed, some who full-time work in the industry, but there are also some that are nascent and learning, and so having both the support of U.S. Cyber Command and, and CIS is instrumental to the 54. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, sir. Dane Bloxma from Joint Task Force Series. I was wondering about your agency's relationship with DISA and Joint Force Headquarters, Doden, uh, and then a follow-on if uh, you all run into any impediments when it comes to information sharing and classification. Yeah, so two, two good questions. So first, um, on the relationship with, uh, with DISA, yes, we have an extremely close one. So um, I didn't talk a lot about today, but part of CISA's core operational responsibility is uh, kind of the operational lead for the security of the federal civilian executive branch, um, which are the 102 uh, civilian federal agencies, everything from large cabinet agencies like DHS or the Department of Justice, uh, down to micro agencies like the Marine Mammal Commission. Um, you know, we are not the ones who ultimately manage the security for their network, but we are responsible for providing support. We provide a lot of technology. Um, we've got some new authorities to do more proactive hunting and assessments on those networks. Um, uh, and one of the things we do issue with things like binding operational directives. When we see a, or an emergency directive, when we see a real acute problem, um, we can issue an emergency directive. So for example, in the aftermath of, of solar winds that Sunday night, um, uh, after it was discovered on Saturday, um, that Sunday night, we issued an emergency directive to remove all SolarWinds devices that were um, uh, certain version numbers um, within, within two days. Um, we issued binding operational directives for more long-term strategic uh, focus areas, things like um, uh, that every federal agency needs to have a vulnerability disclosure program so that security researchers can know where to provide critical vulnerabilities on, on federal agency networks. Um, and we work very closely with DISA to make sure that we are sharing information on the actions that each other is taking um, related to the operation of, of our various networks. We don't have exactly the same challenges, so we're not going to be issuing every single directive inside of CISA or the STIGs and other um, actions that um, DISA and um, General Makasoni does as, as his responsibility to be the national manager for um, classified networks. Um, but we do um, share information very routinely on what each other is doing so that we can understand uh, if there's actions that we're not taking, whether we should um, to take any lessons learned from um, actions that you are taking, what's working, what's not. Um, so that relationship is, has, is, is very strong. Um, your, your second question was on? 
uh, any impediments on information sharing? Inform classification. Basically. So this is something where I think, um, if you had probably asked me this question you know, seven years ago, I would have given you a different answer. But I think today, um, it is, we, the relationship is such with kind of the key producers of, of, of intelligence um, that we are able to kind of get information downgraded that we need to uh, at speed. I mean, so NSA, when they produce intelligence, um, uh, for the most part, and almost all of their non-compartmented intelligence is generating unclassified terror line um, victim identifiers um, for CISA and the FBI to go do victim response immediately. Uh, oftentimes we'll get those, start working on exactly the language that we want to use, um, work that with NSA and within hours we're um, going to be getting our teams in the field uh, on the phone with the potential victim of an incident. That is happening literally today in hours. Uh, I think if you had asked me that question five or six years ago it would have been a potentially a multi-day um, fight to, to, to get to where we need to be, but I think we both have recognized uh, the value of, of operationalizing this information as quickly as possible, and when there are times where we can't release information as quickly as we want, um, there's good reason, um, and that is part of a kind of ongoing dialogue with us and, um, and the relevant producers. Uh, we understand what the challenge is, and we kind of work to see, well, if we can't release X, how about Y and Z, can we get that out there um, if we can't get the, 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 you know, some of the key information? Um, but I do think that there, today I can tell you that I do not think that there's any significant impediment to the execution of our cybersecurity responsibilities because of classification. Thank you so much for joining us. That's all the time we have today for questions. But uh, on behalf thank of you. the Office of the Staff Judge Advocate, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. For the live audience, we are on a break until 11.15, so please be in your seats a few minutes before 11.15. We would like to talk to you about what makes working at U.S. Cyber Command, Office of the Staff Judge Advocate, so unique, challenging, and rewarding, and why you would want to join the military cyberspace operations legal community. Experience in any operational field is an outstanding foundation for dealing with cyberspace operations. No matter the domain of operations, international humanitarian law applies in all armed conflicts, and as a matter of Department of Defense policy, it applies to all operations. Observing the principles of military necessity, distinction, proportionality, and humanity is always required, no matter the means or method of operations. However, the way we implement these principles and protect their underlying values are often challenged by cyberspace operations that can achieve strategic effects without rising to the level of a use of force or armed attack. Laws designed primarily to protect life, limb, and property from kinetic attacks do not translate easily when applied to comparatively non-destructive effects. The role of the military cyberspace operations legal community, then, is to interpret an imperfect regime in real time, offering careful consideration of international law, domestic authorities, and policy implications and their impact on national and international security. The work of this community stands within and at the forefront of some of the most complex operational legal issues today. Cyberspace operations legal practitioners have the ability to, through careful and thorough discernment, shape the evolution of practice. It is not uncommon for a cyberspace operations legal practitioner to be asked to weigh in on questions of international sovereignty, domestic criminal laws, constitutional principles, and under certain circumstances, what may be lawful as part of a single mission. Take non-intervention, for instance. In cyberspace, borders are porous and threats can emanate from anywhere and everywhere. As a result, the physical domain does not neatly translate to cyber. This can make working in the cyberspace operations legal community a challenge, as oftentimes legal issues may be cases of first impression. Additionally, cyber lawyers need to be able to effectively distill what can be complicated technical jargon 
and translated into language that is accessible to a broader audience. After all, not everyone speaks in ones and zeros. As a result, cyber lawyers must translate technical information and apply it within our domestic and international legal framework. The cyberspace legal practitioner is not limited to reacting to events, but is also tasked with helping lay the groundwork for a future. The practitioner is asked to weigh in on the ramifications of policy, of potential legislation, of interagency cooperation, and of partnerships with industry, the private sector, and our international partners. The reality is that this is only the beginning. Legal and policy parameters for governing state behavior in cyberspace, domestically and internationally, will continue to evolve in order to keep pace with the threat. Recent events have demonstrated that these issues are not mere hypotheticals or academic exercises, but instead are stark realities that require serious and proactive measures. We look forward to continuing this conversation through our practice and through the thoughtful dialogue demonstrated here at the U.S. Cybercom Legal Conference. We welcome you to join us in the cutting-edge legal practice of cyberspace operations.